Welcome uh, everyone to the ITC lunch. We have to start uh, promptly because uh, there is another event today uh, starting at 1.30 and we need to clear this room at 1.30 so we have to stick by the strict timetable that we have. Uh, we just heard an excellent uh, ITC colloquium by Jennifer Barnes, uh, who is sitting over there. And uh, she will tell us uh, some more interesting things from Colombia. She will tell us about some other things uh, later this lunch. Uh, actually, we have a very interesting set of talks today. Uh, we'll start with uh, Anna Ijas, uh, who is with us uh, this year. Uh, and she was uh, several years back as well. Um, you remember her, uh, and she works on the very early universe, even before the Big Bang. Uh, and she will talk about cosmic spikes. Yes, uh, it would have been interesting before the Big Bang. Yes. Uh, and then we'll hear from Robin uh, Walsworth, uh, visiting us from Harvard the Seas. We're here with Robin, uh, doing very exciting work about uh, the next generation climate modeling using line by line radiative transfer and generalized convection which could potentially be of interest to astrophysics in many contexts, not just planets. Uh, and then we'll hear from Jennifer Barnes uh, about uh, diagnosing nuclear synthesis from daytime kilonovan light curve. And finally, we'll hear from uh, Michael Rigal, and uh, he is visiting from two institutions that I have a hard time identifying, so maybe he can explain. NRS slash IN2P3. <laughs> and where is he? Yeah, yeah. What is? He's actually here at the Center in the for National Research. So the NP3 is a part of the different, like DOE. Okay. Now we know. Thank you. <laughs> and he will talk about the astrophysical biases of type 1A supernovae and the H0 tension that we are hearing more and more about. Yeah. Anna. Okay, thanks, Ali. Um, so, as Avi said, mm, the main question I think about most of the time is whether the universe started with a bang. And really, what uh, I, and I assume that most of you say, of course, we know that. And what I want to convince you in the next 10 minutes is that it's very much of an open question. And it very much should be decided and could be decided by observations um, that we should be able to, done, to, be, to do soon. OK, just let's spend the first two or three minutes of explaining why um, theories that do not that assume that the current expanding phase, so I obviously, when I ask uh, if the universe started with a Big Bang, I don't question that our current expansion phase that we, dis that we call Big Bang cosmology as we describe it is correct. I'm questioning whether the source, the origin of this phase was what people assume to be the beginning of time um, and quantum gravity event, what many people call cosmic singularity, or eventually it was just a transition from a pre-phase that then during which the universe contracted and um, transited that is bounds from this contraction to an expanding phase. Now this, this idea is really not new. It's exactly as odd as the expanding idea uh, as was presented within the very same paper um, that the expansion was presented by Friedman in 1917. Um, that what you see is here the Friedman equation. So what we know is that our universe is on large scales very simple and we know it by observations. It is described really by this very simple friedman robertson volker geometry that has only a single dynamical parameter, which we call the scale factor, he denoted by A. And if we evaluate the Einstein equations, we know we're in a relativistic universe. So in large scales, the universe is not well described by Newtonian physics, but we need a general relativity. Then we uh, um, get the Friedman equation, where the left-hand side of the Friedman equation here are working Planck units, or reduced Planck units, uh, is the Hubble parameter squared. The Hubble parameter is the, uh, the first time derivative of the logarithm of the scale factor, as you can see it. And we know that it has two physical meanings. The one is that it tells you the, its inverse is the Hubble radius. It tells you the maximal distance. You can see the maximal distance of causal connectedness. But we also know that its square represents the total energy density. Now we know from gravity, so, so as you know, it in, we, 
we know that we live in a relativistic universe because we have two dynamical quantities. The one is just a physical quantity, the scale factor describing a geometry, but there's a second distance, this is the Hubble radius, um, where that tells us that the horizon, and it's very well approximates the uh, distance of causal connectedness, the horizon, which is sourced by the matter content of the universe that you see on the right-hand side of this equation. So if, if we go through it, then we see that the one thing that's important in this equation, so we have matter density, uh, radiation density, we can add spatial curvature and isotropy. And for an early universe cosmologist, the most important aspect of this equation is that the constituent energy densities of the total energy density go at different powers of the scale factor, which means um, if we assume a contracting universe where the scale factor decreases with time going forward, um, then what you see is that an isotropy grows very quickly as the scale factor uh, decreases, while radiation goes, matter goes, goes slower, radiation goes even slower, and uh, spatial curvature goes even less slow. So the important thing to notice is to, first of all, the relative energy densities evolve at different rates, as I emphasized, but there is a second point uh, which is important, while getting such a simple geometry is not, not so easy. You see, this term, which represents the anisotropy, would come to dominate very quickly if you don't do anything else. So instead of ending up with some nice friedman roberts and walker universe, if you assume a contracting phase, where you would end up with a messy and isotropic universe. And so the idea about 20 years ago that was introduced um, is to, well, how about we assume an energy density that smooths out this phase? Just uh, um, in, in parentheses, I should mention, it's a similar idea uh, uh, as that underlies inflation. That if you introduce some uh, energy density that can be associated with the equation of state, where the equation of state here is parameterized as 3 halves times 1 plus W, and W is just the ratio between pressure and energy density of the corresponding energy component, then you see epsilon only has to be greater than 3 to suppress all contents, all, all, all contributions to the total energy density that uh, would prevent you from converging to a smooth universe. So this is the idea that has been around 20 years ago, and because it's such a simple idea, uh, people uh, pursue it. And so the next about five to six minutes, I want to tell you that one can do a lot by asking, can we learn something from taking GR so seriously that we try to solve the full Einstein equations and see how powerful this mechanism is, and maybe we can also find new observables. So what I should mention here is that cosmologists, especially early universe cosmologists, very often don't use computers that much except when they evaluate uh, observations. But in order to do that theories, many people very often stick to pencil and paper and a little bit of perturbation theory. On the one hand, it's perfectly fine because we know that even though uh, we live in a highly relativistic universe, we know that the essential nonlinearity is encoded into the exact friedman roberts and walker solution. So therefore, we just can go a little far away from this solution and get by with pencil and paper. And it can explain a lot. However, if you are a cosmologist and want to ask, how generic is your behavior? How generic is this smoothing behavior? One question that you might want to ask is, how generic is the smoothing depending on the initial conditions? And if you don't start close to the friedman roberts and walker universe, then you have to solve the Einstein equations because by, with a computer, just as you have to solve it when you want to model black hole mergers. And indeed, this is one of the ongoing projects that um, I'm doing. Uh, in the moment, we solve the Einstein equations currently in one dimension, the full Einstein equation using techniques of numerical GR. And what you will see here is the universe in a box. For simplicity, the x-axis will represent just one spatial dimension. We don't assume inhomogeneities in, let's say, the y and z dimension. This is the x dimension. And the um, y-axis will be just the normalized energy densities, just what you saw in the Friedman equation for a smooth universe you see here that the scale of field matter that should be smoothing the universe is represented by yellow uh, curvature, spatial curvature that was represented in the uh, Friedman equation by k over a squared. It's blue and sheer the anisotropy that was represented. That would be the dangerous term in a contracting phase is represented by yellow. Now, this calculation that we do with the computer could never be done by pencil and paper because what you see is we start with very large shear contribution, very anisotropic geometry. That means we are nowhere close to, to, to FRW universe. So what you see here is the following. You see, as, as time goes on, what really happens is curvature gets suppressed. 
Now, this is something we would have expected because already in the homogeneous solution we saw it should drop very quickly relative to the other energy densities. But the second thing that you see is there are regions, those are the regions where yellow dominates, that are dominated by this good kind of scalar field matter, those are the smooth regions, and there are bad regions that are still dominated by anisotropy. So the first question, and this is for fairly generic initial conditions, one aspect of the project that we are doing is how generic is this picture that you see that a lot of regions are dominated by anisotropy, by, uh, by uh, a smooth uh, uh, scale field matter, and uh, some regions by anisotropy. And first of all, what you might ask is, how big is that bad region? And that's one can answer. One can measure the proper, so one, once you did the simulation, you can extract the proper volume uh, of the bad region relative to the good region. And just as you could guess is, as the Hubble radius is a good distance measure, it's covariant. So non-perturbative generalization is a good volume measure. So because we see here the inverse, so the inverse Hubble parameter is the Hubble radius. So here the covariant generalization that for the experts we call labs is a good measure of inverse volume. So if I run the simulation corresponding exactly to the same uh, uh, spatial distribution and evolution and want to measure proper volume, what you see here is that the region, the shear region, has very large labs, which means large labs measures inverse volume. That means very small proper volume corresponds to the bad region. So that's good news because what it really means is two things. Even if the bad region turns out to be generic and we run it now for a really large variety of initial conditions, and we also, I should mention, extend the simulation to two and three dimensions, even if it seems to be generic, it also generically occupies little volume. So the smoothing mechanism that uh, seems to be a good smoother when you are close to the solution where you want to get the Firman, Robertson, Walker, seems to be a good smoother also when you are very far away from it. And the simulation or solving the Einstein equations plays a really big role because you could never have guessed it. Uh, from the linear ice, from, from the exact solution, perturbative solution. But to get to my talk's title, there is something much more interesting, at least to me much more interesting. So what I mentioned is it looks like that this messy region is somewhat generic. It looks like that no matter how long we run the simulation, for most of the initial conditions we get some messy region. I only need one more minute. Um, and so this messy region is very interesting. What happens here is and maybe I just run for the simulation and then. So what we had to do is first of all use adaptive mesh refinement because it's very difficult to, the resolution for, for a reason that I explain in a moment is making it very challenging to understand the bad region. So what you see here is just really a magnification of the bad region, this anisotropic region. And what happens here is one can understand in the following way. So when the universe contracts, then there are the good regions that are dominated by the scalar field matter and these bad regions behave in the following way. The more you approach, uh, go forward in contraction, what happens is that spatial dependence, these gradients become completely unimportant. However, the scale factor develops uh, chaotic behavior. So in the x, y, and z, z direction, the scale, factor, the, the scale factor splits up into three, and typically into two directions it contracts, and one direction it expands. But in which direction it contracts and expands also changes with time. So what you see here is the so-called bounces are every space-time region contracts and expands in different directions, and they switch roles. And in between these switching, there are, these, there are regions that are on the, on the edge of two regions that, that switch contraction and expansion, and there you see those little spikes. So here you see them as so I run it once again. You see? What's happening is these little crinkles. This is not numerical noise. These are these spikes that are on the edge of different uh, of regions that behave dynamically differently. And these spikes here manifest themselves as points. Uh, but if we go into higher dimension, we can show mathematically that there are co-dimension one quantities. So in a true three plus one setup, they would be um, just um, uh, two-dimensional, which means they are similar to domain walls. And why are they very interesting and why are you looking at them? Because typically, um, such phenomena source gravitational waves. So what we are studying now, it's very difficult because this is approximately as far as you get even in 1D, 2D, it's even more difficult with numerics because as you go further and further, uh, these spikes narrow down more and more and more. 
So you cannot keep up no matter how good your adaptive mesh refinement is. Even if you parallelize it, you cannot keep up with them. So you have to go back to pencil and paper and try to figure what is the exact prediction of this is. But, uh, so this is what we do now. But we are fairly confident that due to the genericity of these regions, at the end of the day, we can predict the gravitational wave spectrum that should come from them. So this would be certainly something that people have not yet recognized because they stuck to pens and paper calculations and at the same time should be a signature of contracting phases that we should be able to detect either with cosmic microwave background measurements or with gravitational wave interferometry. Thank you. And of course, the, the, the spectrum of gravitational waves would be quite different than you expect from either inflation yeah. or uh, quantum fluctuations yeah. because you have this special. You would have absolutely non Gaussian, so that would be a very uh, Gauss, uh, non Gaussian, yeah. Because it's a local phenomena, one of the reasons would be that you would not expect the scale invariant spectrum. This would be something that looks quite differently and would be typical for certain scales, but yes. also, there is a it's a planar geometry, yeah. so you get a wave that doesn't decay the same way. It would be similar to the, the waves that people compute from defects, from, for example, domain walls. So that would be the most similar factor, yeah. yeah. Questions? Yeah. I have two questions. So, yeah. um, how informative <coughs> uh, the initial condition needs to be in order to see that kind of impact when shear dominates? Okay, so it doesn't really depend on how inhomogeneous the initial condition It depends on that you do the full numeric uh, non perturbative calculations because it's a non perturbative effect. So, if you start, let's say, if you start arbitrarily close to Fermat Robertson Walker, that is actually what I let uh, Bill Cook um, on the other side, uh, um, uh, the force of quad work with you, then you, the region is very small. But there is always that it is more the proper volume of the region that depends on how close you start to FRW. There is always some effect. We never get like a completely smooth uh, and there is always some volume, but the proper volume of the region depends on how close you start, of the bad region, how close you start it to FRW. And also, um, the spikes you mentioned, the region, in the region where the shear dominates, mm -hmm. it seems that it cannot be responsible for the initial condition of the <coughs> So that region is not as, as a traffic enough to, to be bad enough. Yeah, so what you're saying is it cannot be the dominant contribution to volume. What we, what we look at is what if this parts of it survive. So let's say we know that that's true. We cannot take a patch to be the source of our current universe that is dominated by this bad region. What we ask is if it's generic, then there might be no parts of this patch that ex exhibited this behavior. So I agree with you. Dominantly, it won't be that. It's dominantly already not, not, the, not the main volume. That's the question here. So um, what would one look for in either the primordial power mm -hmm. spectrum or large-scale structure studies that would be a signature of this? That's an excellent question, and I cannot give you a complete answer because we are very much in the beginning. First of all, would be the gravitational wave signal, and similar to relatively low amplitude, similar to, let's say, the main one, because defined gravitational wave. The second question would be that we are very much interested in whether that the, these, these anisotropic regions are less confident about the food source primordial black holes. So that could be something that could, I'm less confident, I'm more confident about the gravitational wave, but we are studying that too. Well, I should mention uh, uh, that Anna has two PhDs. She, when she came here, she already had a PhD in philosophy and she did a PhD in physics, and she's moving in the direction from conceptual, analytic, considerations to numerical, which is interesting. And I um, just wanted to highlight that because she uh, also accepted the uh, faculty position, a, a very uh, a prestigious faculty position at the Max Planck Institute in Germany recently, right? Yeah, that's true. <laughs> I checked it last week, but thank you, Avi. I owe it all to Harvard, so <laughs> thank you. So let's thank uh, Anna. <laughs> Okay, so can everyone hear me okay at the back? Should I use the mic? Is that better? Okay. I can shout, but...
Ah, okay. I want to keep some of my voice for this afternoon as well. So, yeah, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, slight change of scale with this talk. We're going to be going down to planetary scale. So I'm a, uh, I'm a scientist working in the Earth and Planetary Science Department in, in this university. And um, as I'm giving the colloquium this afternoon, I, was, uh, I think it's, I guess, a standard invited to give this 10-minute talk. And I thought, ah, Institute of Theory and Computation. So it makes sense for me to talk about computation in, in our field. So I want to start this with a question, which is, what is the best way to model planetary climate? It's a trick question, because there is no best way. But um, maybe I can begin with my own personal favorite way of modeling, which is just back of the envelope, pen and paper, doing things um, completely analytically. And it's, it's the most fun, and it's really powerful in a, a wide variety of circumstances. But it's not on its own sufficient, as in many other fields, because um, sometimes you need to go to higher levels of complexity. And so um, one step beyond that is to have um, what's known as a radiative convective model. And so in this circumstance, what you're doing is saying that the planet's completely the same across the horizontal dimension. We're just looking at the changes in the vertical dimension. And um, you can make various assumptions for the radiative transfer. In this example, I'm showing you a line-by-line -line radiative transfer computation. So let's have a little more to say about that in just a moment. But with these kind of models, you can very quickly skim through parameter space and, and um, learn things in, in general about systems in a way that goes beyond pen and paper calculations. Um, and then, at least right now in our field, the most complex thing one can do is um, go to a full 3D calculation and use a, a general circulation model, or GCM. And so what you're doing here is basically solving the fluid dynamic equations on the sphere. Um, and so you, you have a fluid dynamic component, but then you need to couple that to other physical, chemical, and potentially biological processes. And um, the most important one, I think, is radiative transfer. But then on top of that, you have convection, you have clouds, and um, many other things in principle that, that need to be taken into account. So what I want to talk about here is a new type of planetary climate model that we've, we've just been developing, which um, operates in 3D and, and um, we think is going to be useful for a very wide range of, uh, of circumstances. So let's talk about the fluid dynamics modeling part initially. Um, there's lots of things you can do, but I've listed just three here. The first one is finite difference, which is basically what I was showing in this plot. You just take a coordinate system, most of the simplest spherical coordinates, divide the, the system up and then solve it. And it's simple and fairly robust, and it's what has frequently been used in the past. But um, it has some disadvantages, one of which is it's hard to parallelize. And then it also gets highly inaccurate of the poles because of the CFL criterion. You're getting smaller and smaller grid cells. And so you have to perform averaging or, or um, some other kind of approximation. That usually means you can't trust climate that much at, at poles with this kind of setup. Another thing you can do is a spectral calculation, which can be very fast in idealized circumstances. But the moment you put in things like topography or clouds or precipitation, which, let's be honest, most planets have, um, you end up with a, a model which can be quite unstable. So it's, it's good for idealized circumstances, but not for more generalized modeling. And then there's a cubed sphere approach. And so this is the one we're using in this model. And what you're basically doing here is, as the name implies, is taking a cube and um, unfolding it out onto the sphere, wrapping it around. And so you end up with a series of grid points, which vary in shape and volume somewhat, but not by a huge amount. So it's a finite volume approach. And it um, is extremely parallelizable, which is great for modern computation. And it also removes the polar problem, because you, you don't have any um, special change in coordinates there. So we use the cube sphere approach for, for, for the fluid dynamics part. Um, the rate of transfer modeling, um, there's, again, I'm listing three possible things you can do here. First and simplest is gray gas. You just say there's no variation in absorptivity with, um, with wavelength. And this is fast and simple and, and kind of like the back of the envelope stuff. It's excellent for building intuition. Um, but if you want to go to a greater degree of realism, it's, it's inappropriate. And so an intermediate step you can do, um, which is currently used in quite a lot of models and, in fact, was... Um, so the, the first GCM doing this correlated care approach was, was something I, I built as a postdoc. But, um, and so its advantages are that it's quite fast still. Um, 
it's reasonably accurate, but you have to do a conversion from the uh, spectral part to um, the, the, the correlated K coefficients, which can take um, a lot of time, up to a month, if you want to complete a completely new planetary atmosphere. And um, it's hard to constrain accuracy. So you, you end up with something that you try to validate against a few cases, but then once you go into the more general configuration, you're not really sure how well it's doing. And if you want to calculate observables, which is particularly important for thinking about exoplanets, then you need intensive post-processing. So then the final thing is line by line, which is actually, I mean, it's not quite as simple as gray gas, but it's, it's very simple in the sense that you just take the input spectroscopic data and then you calculate the absorptivity at each point and, and then run that into the model. And um, it's both accurate and flexible in the sense that you can, in your model, define whatever your composition of the atmosphere is and then set things running. Um, and then, so the disadvantage of line by line is that, that it's, it's slower than the other approaches. And until recently, it was thought much too slow to, to be run in something like a 3D model. Um, but um, it turns out with, with um, the right kind of coding assumptions and um, a lot of computational resources, then you can, you can make this work effectively. So um, this is something that, that we've uh, now developed and we've, we've uh, submitted the, the first initial stage of this. And so when you're modeling planets, one thing you learn quickly is that Earth is the most complicated planet. So if you want to do something simple, you start with an exoplanet. Um, so <laughs> what we've done here is a hypothetical study of Gliese A1132b, which is, um, was discovered by the Earth team and is, is close in. So we think it may have uh, undergone substantial water loss, which may have led to buildup of uh, a oxidized atmosphere. And so we're simulating one hypothetical state for this exoplanet here. And uh, you can see the animation in the plot on the top left. Um, the, um, the plot here shows how the spectral model converges as you get more and more points. And um, the, the basic synopsis is that you can have any degree of accuracy you want, but it's always up to a certain pressure level in the atmosphere. So um, you decide how high to, to, to how low pressures you want to go in your simulation, and then you choose your spectral resolution based on that, and, and you, can, um, you can check the result in 1Z and then proceed to simulate it from there. And I think a major advantage of this approach is that it allows us direct prediction of observables from the, the 3D model. So you, you don't need to do subsequent post-processing. You can just directly take the output and then see what that tells you about, about outgoing radiation, and then from there, um, um, transit spectroscopy and, and uh, other things like that. Um, the plot down here on the left is just to show that we're now moving into implementing convection in the model as well. So this is an idealized case with no topography, but we've already found that the, the transition to the, the more accurate rate of transfer gives better results for things like position of the subtropical jets and um, the, the locations of storm tracks versus what you get if you, uh, if you use the old scheme. So I guess I don't have much time left, but um, just to finish up, um, a few of the things we want to investigate with this. So I mentioned exoplanets. I'm going to be talking this afternoon about Mars's early climate evolution. This is something we're really excited about, about doing more detailed modeling on. But in a couple of extra applications, the first is the snowball Earth events, which occurred, um, the sequence of them occurred about 740 million years ago on Earth, and there's a few others it's, uh, throughout Earth history. Um, we want to look at the uh, initiation mechanisms for this. And one important class of initiation mechanisms is, is volcanic eruptions. So you need a fairly sophisticated uh, climate model to look at that in detail. We've done the initial toy model approach, and it's now something we want to, want to look at with, with more detail. And then the final one, and I really probably don't have time to talk about this in detail, but um, there's some quite fascinating evidence from volcanic vesicles that nitrogen levels on Earth may have varied very substantially through time. So it's a kind of embarrassing fact of meteorology that the most fundamental aspect of our, of our planet's atmosphere, that the pressure, is not well constrained, and we don't really have a theory for why it's currently one bar or great understanding about what it was going back through time. But based on some of these observations, it looked like it fluctuated, and this does very interesting things, in particular to where the H2O goes in your atmosphere. And so if you... If you have a lower nitrogen atmosphere, you can propagate water to the high atmosphere, which may oxidize your planet. And so 
there's a lot of implications for climate evolution, but you need to, to understand this in detail, you need to run a three-dimensional model that can, that can handle that convection and that propagation. So that's a, another thing we're very interested to investigate in the future. So I'll leave it there and take any questions. Thank you. Right. Well, the second quote uh, uh, is uh, there is a saying that uh, if you don't want to tell the truth, you, you put your evidence very far away. <laughs> yeah, I mean, exactly. And I think that the reason that we can do this kind of thing with exoplanets right now is because we don't know very much about them. And so um, perhaps a better way to put it is a, a theorist's conception of an exoplanet right now can be simpler than a theorist's conception of Earth, because we have so much more data. But it is true as well in the solar system. I mean, we have a lot of observations of Venus and Mars in other cases now, and I, I am fascinated by Mars, and there's a lot of complex things there, but I still think that the Earth is more complex. So you could have a long debate on this stuff, but it's an interesting question. Of course, yeah. <laughs> You get lots of lines, yeah. So how are you going to deal with that? Or you're not planning to go to high temperatures yet? I mean, it certainly can be done. I think you just end up with a like longer pre-processing step when the model initializes in order to get those uh, that range of coefficients. So I mean, that is an issue. You're right. Um, if you wanted to go to, um, we're kind of focused on the terrestrial planet regime so far, but. Um, for runaway greenhouse, it starts to become important. And then certainly if you're getting into the hot Jupiter regime, then what you would need to think about, about ways to overcome that obstacle and for that, for that case, yeah. So you mentioned clouds a couple of times. Uh -huh. How exactly do you put clouds into the simulation? So you predict? Uh, we, can, we can certainly make predictions of where clouds are gonna be. Um, clouds are, probably the number one challenge for climate simulations, both for present day Earth and for planetary climate. Um, my philosophy on them is that you want to do something simple enough that you can vary parameters and understand what the full range of possibilities is gonna be, rather than taking an Earth-tuned model and, and hoping that they're gonna behave the same under those circumstances. So um, one of the things you can do, for example, is just treat the number of condensation nuclei as a free parameter. And rather than saying you have fixed particle sizes, you just vary that over wide ranges and see the, the, the range of things that can come out. But um, yeah, the, the, there's no easy answer there. Clouds are complicated and um, we have to deal with them, but um, they, they can be fitted within this framework. Opacity, right? Exactly, yeah. So, so I mean, it, in the spectral sense, they're simpler usually for most particle sizes because you get much flatter variation in the uh, the extinction and absorption properties, but um, that doesn't get around the fact that the microphysics couples to the rate of transfer, which couples to the fluid dynamics, and ends up with a pretty complex problem. Yeah. We need to move on. Uh, there are lots of questions, but uh, actually, um, Robin is around at Harvard, so we have a lot of opportunities. Yeah, I'm, I'm local. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks. Hey, um, sorry, okay, great. All right, um, okay, so yes, I'm Jennifer Barnes. We're gonna be 
I guess, switching topics yet again, because I'm going to be talking about particular astrophysical transients and a little bit of nuclear astrophysics. So very quick review slides here. Uh, neutron star mergers, we believe, produce elements via our process nucleosynthesis. So that's these heavy elements that you forge in very neutron-rich conditions. Um, and then, you know, they're initially uh, produced very far from the valley of stability, so they decay, and that decay energy is going to power an electromagnetic transient called a kilonova. So the kilonova can come in slightly different flavors depending, depending on how mass is ejected from the system. Um, you know, but the important thing to remember is just we make some radioactive material when two neutron stars merge, uh, and then we should be able to see, you know, the glow of the, the radioactivity um, and use that to learn something about the nucleosynthesis that accompanied the event. Um, okay. Yeah, so I think that's kind of pretty well understood, but there are a lot of questions still that remain when we're talking about, I'm sorry, when I say it's well understood, what I mean is that general statement, uh, we seem to agree that it's true. Neutron star mergers burn the R process. But there's still some questions, um, such as, you know, how might the R production in different mergers vary? And I will tell people who are not in this field, you know, right now we've seen one neutron star merger. Um, so it's kind of hard to make, to extrapolate information from that into the general population of mergers. Um, there's also this question about, you know, whether the gravitational wave, uh, or I'm sorry, the neutron star merger that we did see, GW170817, like exactly what kind of R process it produced, right? Because there can be some variability in the way that R process operates. Um, if you were at the ITC colloquium, I talked a lot about this. I'll just talk a little bit about it here. Um, but, you know, exactly what elements you get out of a given R process event can depend on, you know, some nuclear physics parameters. So exactly what you assume about the nuclear masses and beta decay rates and neutron capture cross sections and things like that far from stability. And it can also depend on astrophysical conditions. So exactly what is happening um, in the outflows where the R process is happening. So that's what you kind of see uh, with these two plots. This top one focuses on uh, the different abundance patterns that you get with different nuclear mass models. The bottom one shows how what is burned can depend on your initial conditions, um, in particular, you know, expansion, time scale, and um, the number of free neutrons that are available for the R process when the R process turns on. So even though, you know, we expect from a theoretical perspective, and we have some observational evidence for the fact that neutron star mergers produce the R process, we would like to go beyond that general statement and be able to make more accurate diagnoses about exactly what is produced in a given merger event. Okay, so right now, the tool that we have is a very uh, blunt instrument, and that's this idea of opacity. So again, apologies to people who were at uh, my earlier talk, because this, again, will look familiar to you. Um, but the opacity idea is just that some of the elements burned in the R process that are on the heavier side of things have a much higher opacity than some of the lighter R process elements. Uh, and so, you know, the effect of opacity on light curves and spectra is, is just to make light curves longer and dimmer and spectra redder. So if we see long dim light curves and red spectra, we can infer that, you know, the mixture that produced that emission is at least somewhat enriched with lanthanides and actinides and is not just pure light R process. Okay, as shown here, right? Um, throw in some lanthanides, everything gets longer, dimmer, and redder. Uh, but we would like to be able to go beyond that, because as I said, that's kind of a, a really broad brush that we can use to distinguish light R process from heavy R process. But, you know, the questions that we would like to answer are things like, how well does the composition burned in a particular event match the solar composition? And that obviously requires going beyond, you know, a simple binary approach of saying, yes, lanthanides versus no lanthanides. Um, oh, sorry. So, yes, right now, kind of the way we, we treat this opacity question is, is, again, just to look for whether we see something that looks like a red kilonova or a blue kilonova. Um, but we'd like to go beyond that. So, of course, I think the long-term goal for this field is to develop the tools that we need to do spectral analyses of these transients, both in the photospheric and nebular phase. Um, so, just like we do for supernova, you can look for particular absorption features um, that reflect the presence or even the prominence of particular ions of particular elements. So, this is kind of, I think, a project for, you know, the, the future. People, we are starting as a community to develop the tools to do this for Kilinovi, but it's going to be a very long and complicated process. Um, although, okay, so here's the caveat. Some people have already started trying to identify um, particular lines in the Kilinova spectrum. So, you know, I think we 
can look forward to many years of arguments about whether these little bumps and wiggles are actually cesium and tellurium or whether they come from something else. But, you know, the point is just that uh, we're moving in the right direction. I would say we're not, uh, we're not there yet. So I want to talk about another avenue that we have to answer this question, and that's volumetric luminosity, which is obviously somewhat simpler than spectra. So um, just, you know, radioactive transients 101, right? In the simplest picture, you dump in some energy from radioactivity, you get some light out. Um, in the beginning, the system is optically thin. You don't get that much light out. As it expands, it becomes more diffuse. It's easier for the photons to escape. The light curve peaks, um, and eventually, you know, at very late times, you could say that the light curve just reflects the energy that you're putting in through radioactivity. That's not quite the whole story, though, because not all of the energy you put in from radioactivity is efficiently converted to photons. There is some gap here. Um, and so really, at late times, the, the light curve will reflect not the energy that you put in, but rather the energy that you put in um, minus all of this stuff that doesn't officially convert itself to photons. Um, OK, and so for, you know, for a simple system, like a supernova simple system, um, <laughs> this would just be energy due to like nickel and cobalt. For the R process, it's a little bit more complicated because you have many um, decay channels at play. So we think about beta decay dominantly when we think about uh, our process, because everything is neutron rich, so it will do beta minus decay. But you can also have alpha decay and, and fission, um, and kind of, you know, depending on the relative importance of each of these decay channels um, and on exactly how the energy is injected, each of these can have its own um, thermalization profile. So um, Figuring out the thermalization profile for the different kinds of radioactive decay is something that I worked on a couple of years ago. Um, and I won't go into too much detail here, other than to say that uh, it turns out alpha decay and fission do a better job of heating the ejecta than beta decay. So, um, right, and part of that is just because these are more energetic decays, so you have more energy to begin with. Um, and then also in the case of alpha decay and fission, most of the energy from the decay goes towards massive particles that do a pretty good job transferring their energy into the thermal pool of the ejecta, while beta decay is going to split its energy um, among beta particles and gamma rays and neutrinos. And the gamma rays and neutrinos are not that useful from a thermalization standpoint. Um, okay, right, so I'll just reiterate in words, there are a few things that make fission and alpha particularly appealing. Uh, Right, more energy for decay. Okay, and the third thing I want to mention is that um, because there are fewer decays that contribute to um, alpha particle and fission heating, um, these channels are more likely to deviate from straight power law heating, and that's something that can have an effect on the, the overall efficiency with which material thermalizes in the ejecta. Okay, so our idea, wow, okay, 10 minutes is not a long time. Um, <laughs> All right, so, so one idea that kind of sprung from this work was to ask whether if we wait long enough, there are particular isotopes, probably fission and alpha decay isotopes, that would come to dominate the heating and whether we could look for signs of those. So our ideal isotopes are going to have long half-lives because there are fewer competing decays that will stand out against the background. Um, and we're also interested in fairly heavy species, the idea being if we you know, show that we make some mass number of elements, we can assume that the R process also burned um, you know, elements up to that maximum. Okay, so then these were a few papers that kind of jumped off of that idea. Uh, the first one looked at the effect of californium. So uh, this is the rare fissioning isotope that has a pretty long half-life, and that provides a late time energy reservoir. So if you compare the heating that you get, the total heating for a composition with and without californium, you can see that you get like a substantial bump uh, in heating just from the inclusion of this single isotope. Um, and then if you kind of convert that into an estimate of the luminosity you should get out, you know, we're taking, we're basically taking the system from dashed to solid um, in these infrared bands just by the inclusion of this particular isotope. So you definitely get a boost in your heating just from Californium. Um, so I guess a second, uh, let's see, I'll skip over this. A second thing that we looked at, or a, yeah, second paper that came out of this was to look for signatures of particular alpha decaying isotopes. So in this case, we considered a slightly fuller range of um, decay chains. Um, and we modeled their heating in a slightly different way because we assumed that they were decaying in a regime that was not well represented by power law heating, but was instead represented by exponential heating, which gives 
actually a much more efficient thermalization profile. Um, okay, and the take home is if you measure L bowl with great precision, hopefully uh, this will be enabled by some instruments coming online in the future, we might be able to get the kind of measurements we need um, of the bolometric luminosity to start to make inferences about the presence or absence of these particular decay chains. Um, but of course, there are a lot of technical challenges as well as theory and modeling challenges. Um, so we, you know, there's still a lot of work to be done, but hopefully it's kind of a, a hopeful enterprise. Okay, thank you. Yes. The second is the, there could be some activity in the central engine that uh, injects energy, and we, we don't know for sure if, if it's a freeze or. You know, yeah. Yes. <laughs> Those are both true. Although I will say, I think if you're looking at, you know, bolem what we're looking here is in changes to the bolometric light curves. You would look at, like, differences in the changes in the rate of decline, for example. And unless you assume that there's uh, some extreme anisotropy in how the relevant isotopes are distributed in the ejecta, um, while you might have a different normalization for the light curve, if it deviates significantly from you know, sp a spherical geometry, um, the changes you would expect to kind of be the same regardless of viewing angle. So that's, you know, that might kind of provide one avenue to get around at least that issue. Okay, thank you. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, well, thank you very much. Thank you for having me uh, today. So from France, from the CNRS INGP3, that's tricky with plenty of um, letters. So I'm going to talk about not kilonova, but moving to uh, type 1A supernovae. And, and when we start with type 1A supernovae, I thought it's important to start with a Hubble diagram that you all know, I guess. But this is showing you the Hubble, the, the, uh, Hubble diagram, so the distance modulus as a function of red shift. And I would just would like to highlight two things, is that the first is that the Hubble diagram is based on the fact that you need to measure the supernovae at different redshift to, at low redshift, anchor the parameter, which is h naught square times the average emission of the supernovae. At higher redshift, you do the same thing, assuming that this parameter doesn't change, and you can extract um, the properties of the universe in the whole, where you can get the density of matter or dark energy or the properties of the dark energy. And there is an entire talk to do about that for a long, long time, but here I would like to focus on the fact that at the low z here, you can derive one cosmological parameter altogether if you have able to disentangle those two parameters. So basically, if you are able to measure the average emissivity of the type on a supernovae, you can extract directly what is uh, the value of H0 today. So what is the value of the current expansion rate of the universe? And the way we do that is that um, the best way we do that so far is what the Shoes team has been doing is measuring Cephades in galaxies. So Cephades are another uh, really young star with this uh, precision luminosity relation, and you measure the, the Cephate pulsation in, a lot in, in galaxies like this one, and you have a pretty good measurement of uh, the distance of this galaxy. And if this galaxy is a host of a type 1 supernovae, as it is the case here, you know the distance of this type 1 supernovae because you know the, the measurement from the Cephate, and you observe the luminosity of the supernovae, and this way you can derive the, you observe, sorry, the flux of the magnitude of the supernovae, and this way you can get the average luminosity of the supernovae by doing that for a lot of supernovae. So this is a trick. This is how we do the direct measurement of the H0, uh, of the H0 cosmological parameter. If you do that, you find that H0 is at roughly uh, 73.5, so it has been slightly been updated recently. But for the torque, it will be around 73.5 plus or minus uh, uh, 2%. So this is interesting altogether because it's the fundamental cosmological parameter. So this is already pretty good. But it's also pretty interesting because you can compare this measurement with what uh, the CMB is telling you it should be. So the CMB is measuring really well the properties of the universe at a rate of 1,000. And if so, you have, this is initial conditions 
uh, for your model, and then your model is deterministic, so you should be able to predict what should be the expansion rates. So we had any redshift uh, given a cosmological model, and if you do that in the lambda CDM uh, model, you find that H naught should be something around 67.4 plus or minus roughly 1%. But you can change the model. For instance, uh, if you uh, had new particles that uh, play a role of an effective uh, dark, uh, effective radiation model, you can in increase what you expect H naught to be. So if you add, for instance, one extra neutrino, for instance, then H naught should be around 73. But if you increase the total size of the neutrino, then the expectation of H naught is smaller. So that is interesting because today you may have heard of it. There is a big debate in the cosmological world because um, you will have a tension which is roughly 4.5% so 4.5 4 sigma today between the direct measurements of H naught that tells you something around 73 and the expectation from lambda CDM plus uh, um, CMB Planck which is around uh, 67. So it's a huge difference, almost 5 sigma, not only because it's a 5 sigma threshold limit uh, that you have all in your mind, but it's also because this is so far, the only cosmological parameter that we can directly measure with no further assumptions that we can compare to what um, the model should be, how, how it should be. This is the only test, only direct test of cosmology we can do, and it is wrong at roughly five sigma. So you have a lot of debate because this could be highlighting new physics, and I'm not going to discuss that today, but it could also be, and usually when you have that, it's, it's either new physics, but usually it's systematic error. And, and, and I will try to emphasize that it could be a systematic error from the type on a supernovae. And one of the main issues here is that, despite the success of Type 1 supernovae for the last 30 years, we still don't know what Type 1 supernovae are. And this is really a big problem, to me, at least. And, and so, uh, there is a lot of modeling ongoing, but it's extremely difficult to model what Type 1 supernovae are. So far, the, direct, the modeling are not able to reproduce what we observe. So, my approach was different, is that looking not at trying to model the supernovae, but looking at this environment, like this pretty nice, uh, uh, M101 spiral phase on galaxy, where you have it SN11 FE here, and the question is, are the supernovae all the same, depending on where they come from? And the idea here is that you use the properties of its environment as a tracer of the properties of the supernova itself. So, for instance, you can ask the question, are the supernovae the same if they are coming from spiral or elliptical galaxy? And if not, what, what is the reason for that? And, and you can look at global properties as a tracer of the supernova here, but you even see that in, in spiral galaxies like that, they are really complex, and so the trick uh, I've been doing is I'm trying to look at the environment, the direct environment of the supernova here. So for instance, it happened in this case at the end of a spiral arm where you have all those blue stars, a young star, and maybe the supernova would have been different if I explored it here in the middle of nowhere or here in the core where you have more dust, but also all the stars. And if we do that uh, with an eye view, so this is a spectrograph, you can get pixels, like big pixels where you don't have just a value but you have an entire spectra. We, I was able to look at the uh, envir local environment of a lot of type 1 supernovae, about 150. And in this case here, you see the location of two type 1 supernovae that uh, globally is a, the galaxy are similar. But if you look closely here, this is an H alpha map, which is basically a star formation map. Where it's yellow, it means you have a lot of star formation, but where it's, it's uh, dark, it means that there is no young stars, there is no star formation. And you see that in this case, the type 1 supernovae happen in, in a star forming area, while here, the the closest star formation is about two kiloparsecs away. And if you give, so this map is telling you the number of young stars you have where the supernovae has exploded. And you can do the same map with the mass, not the alpha, but the mass, and this is telling you the number of all stars you have at the very same location. If you do the ratio of those two things, you know what is the fraction of young star you have at the supernovae location. And if you look now at the Herbal residuals, so this line here at zero is Herbal residuals, so basically the Herbal diagram where you remove the expansion rate of the universe. So this is uh, showing you on the top, supernovae on the top are uh, fainter than on average, and if supernovae on the bottom are brighter than the average supernovae. And if you look at that as a function of the local specific star formation rate, so the fraction of young stars at supernovae location, you do see that the supernovae from young environments are significantly brighter, sorry, fainter than the supernovae from an old environment. And you see a really nice step function like that. And this, this difference in magnitude is about six sigma today. And so this, this, uh, what I'm claiming is that this is actually the source of the Ishtan tension. I will show you why. But just to mention that I'm not the only one seeing that in our sample. It's actually been observed by another, several other teams. And here be careful, Young is on the right, but here Young is on the left because it's using the U minus V color as a, tr as a probe for a young star. So it is not as good as a specific star formation rate, but it's a pretty good measurement of the same thing, right? U, U means you have a lot of young stars, they are bright in blue, 
and, and V is a sub zero in red, so if you have a lot of V, you have a lot of all star. And you see the same thing here. It's about the seven sigma measurement. It's much blurry, but they have many more supernovae, so the signal is, is roughly similar. And this has consequences for cosmology. For instance, the fraction of young star is evolving as a function of time. But uh, this is not the topic for today. The topic for today is about H0. And the question is, how could this affect H0, knowing that the, the, the basic the property of the supernovae at the direct where you can find Cepheid and slightly higher where you are in the Hubble flow, is it basically the same time in history for the universe? Mm -hmm. The trick here is that on, on the very way we measure the H0 uh, measurements, we need to have Cepheid, which are bright young stars. And so the idea is that if you have Cepheids in the spiral in, in galaxy like that, it means you have a lot of star formation ongoing because Cepheids are really young stars. They, they, they dis disappear right away after several hundred mega years. And we actually looked at it. And we looked at all the supernovae that have a direct Cepheid measurement. All of them are young. And so when we do this technique, you actually don't observe the average immunity of the supernovae. You measure the average immunity of the young supernovae. And because the young supernovae and the old supernovae don't have the same magnitudes, then you have a bias when you derive H0 by injecting this average limit of the supernovae in the Hubble flow sample. And if you correct for that, then the, the correction is about 3%. So this is the same plot here showing you, if I take the reset tunnel measurement and I correct for the difference in magnitude and the difference of fraction of young and old you have in two samples, then you have a shift which is up to 3%, which is, much, which is more than all the other are combined. So this is actually a dominating effect now in the measurement of H0. And this is an extremely strong debate we have with the supernovae community. And, and for the few seconds I have left, I just want to highlight that only two things need to be true here for this measure, these things to be true, is that the fraction of young stars is different in between the Cepheid and the Hubble flow sample from about 90% to 50%. And you also need the fact that the young and the old one are different in magnitude, because if they are not different, we don't care. And they have to be different about 0.15 which is uh, roughly what we find. And I have another talk tomorrow where I can di discuss that in more detail. You need to learn more about how this works in details. So I invite you to come tomorrow, and I think my time is over. Thank you. Looked into this discrepancy, it doesn't seem like there is a, a very appealing theoretical <laughs> Resolution, it's a model that looks natural. Yeah. Yeah. All the theoretical explanations yeah. appear to be contrived. So this this would be a very welcome resolution. But I was wondering what what's the reaction of the people who want to get a second Nobel Prize uh, to your criticism? So um, the main reaction is that they don't quite agree with that. Um, as of, I mean, this has been ongoing for since uh, the first paper in 2015. And, and I think the, the disagreements, the source of the disagreement has changed quite a bit ever since. So at the beginning, everything was wrong, and now I think uh, the way that everything we say is correct, but it doesn't apply to their sample. This is now the main, the main difference. And, and, and so we, we see it. So we see the different magnitudes. Uh, we see it. Every, every other team sees it, but it, apparently it is not in their sample. So now the main thing Adam is telling us is that we need to actually do this measurement and confirm everything from there later. The problem is that it's really hard to measure the H alpha map and doing this properly for their data because basically it means another entire campaign that took us five years, ten years to do. So it's pretty hard, but I'm, I'm ongoing, uh, I have a team now uh, working with me on that and we're trying to find a way to, to do that. Uh, I would just like to highlight that uh, the main thing they say is that the only selection effect they do is that they need to have, uh, the, what they say that the selection is uh, you, to have the set phase is that your galaxy needs to be roughly phased on so you can measure the set phase and spiral where you can find set phase. And they say that they look at all the supernovae where they could find set phase like that. And if they apply the same simple cut in the Hubble flow one, which is basically a morphology cut, then they don't see a, a, a difference in H0. And here it, it is surprising when they say that, well, like, there's three really strange because I'm expecting one. And the problem is that, this is going to be something I'm going to present tomorrow, is that the, actually the morphological measurement is a pretty bad age tracer. Uh, because there is all star in spiral, and there is also, I mean, morphology is pretty, pretty zero level uh, astrophysic. And, and the other thing is that our sample is not that simple because, for instance, if you look, there, is, uh, uh, there are 18 supernovae where they can do this measurement so far in 16 galaxies, which means that there is two galaxies where you have two pairs of supernovae in 18. We have now with ZTS, which is a precursor of LST, we have already 500 supernovae in the Hubble flow, and we have one case of, of a of uh, a host having two supernovae. So it's a really strange sample they have, and it's really important to understand 
really where this uh, set phase sample because it has huge consequences for physics. Uh, so, yeah. Questions? Uh, let's start with Rosanna. In terms of the population, when you have a young galaxy with a lot of star formation, presumably that galaxy also has old stars. There yes. is some history of star yeah. formation. So in a galaxy like that, depending on the history of star formation, there may be supernovae of the type, I'm assuming they are yeah. different for a moment, you know, the type yeah. from young and old, you would have the older type there as well as the younger type, whereas yeah. the, the ones that are pure are in the older galaxies, assuming no recent star formation. So how does that get folded in? I see that 90% figure up there, and I don't know if that's, take, if that's the figure that's so taking it into the, account. So the question here is how, how, when I'm saying that this tracer here, uh, the local specific star formation rate, then I call out that by saying my probability to be young. And what you're saying is that some case here where you have a lot of star formation with supernova is actually this might not be young. This could be old one on top of that. So it is actually is true. It's just something we are working on. Uh, the, the thing here is that so to know the age of the supernovae, of the progenitor, you need two things. You need the star formation history, that could be anything. And you need to convolve that with what we call the data time distribution. It means that when, you supernova, when the star has formed, how long does it take for it to blow up in time when the supernovae is good? And it's actually something that picks really high, so there is an entire field of research for that. And it's a T2 mother minus 1 though. And which means that if you have a convolution of those two things, if you have a bit of star formation, your chance to be young is extremely high. And then if you miss this chance, Okay. then you need to wait a long, long time to have enough old stars to, to, to have a second peak again. And this is actually the, the source of the A plus B model that we have in the field for 10 years now. We are, we are short on time, so just okay. more questions. Uh, sorry. Yeah. Tomorrow. Tomorrow. Yeah. Sorry. Okay. I'm sorry. So it sounds like you're on the second stage of success. Now that the first stage is you propose a new theory and everybody says, no, that's wrong. And on the second stage, they say, well, it might be right, but it's irrelevant. And the third stage, I've always said that. <laughs> but my question was on the last view graph where it says there's no tension between these two measurements, yeah. but the two uh, peaks are kind of still widely separated. There's some overlap. So what? What's going to happen now? Are they, are they so, I mean, we don't, for it to not be a tension, they don't need to be aligned. They need to, the significance of this tension has to be something below 2%. And so the correct answer is in the overlap region? Or? It's about two, there are two sigma away, which means that that's fine. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's, I mean, yeah. I mean maybe, maybe this shrinks down too, and then it will be five sigma again. I don't know, we're just saying that this is so far. Well, on this note, we have to conclude the interview for Thank you very much. Well, they, they passed the